Well, what an interesting day this is turning out to be. And the, <laughs> the uh, non-X Factor uh, session we just had um, seems to have had an extremely interesting and potentially creative outcome. Now, the final uh, discussion this afternoon, um, which we must try to keep to time on, although it's a subject probably dear to the heart of every, really everybody in the room, is access to the Register of Architects and title of architect uh, on graduation. Um, we've got three speakers with five minutes each to give us their views. So please, to kick us off, please welcome from Squire and Partners, Alison Coutinho. So I should probably put my hand up straight away as being this average student that qualified in nine years and well, three months, but uh, we can call it nine and a half years. Um, I'm now a practicing architect at Squire and Partners. I also am on the validation panel at the RIBA and have been for the last eight years. I'm an external advisor at UCLan. Um, I was part of the SCOSA UK Architectural Review Group. Um, I was, I'm also part of the RIBA um, uh, Review Group for Education. So the way I saw it was, I mean, why did I put off qualifying? And I only really ask myself this question on being asked to speak today. Um, I didn't really feel ready to do part three emotionally. I was absolutely exhausted after part two. Um, I couldn't really afford to do part three. And yes, I happened to at the time work for a practice that didn't support me financially in doing part three. Um, and I also thought I didn't have enough experience. However, the day before and the day after I qualified and um, uh, was added to the register was no different. I was still going to DTMs, chairing DTMs, making client presentations, doing door schedules. There was absolutely no change. And of course, I think this is the context that we have to remember today, that our function isn't protected, it's just our title. And that title, in many ways, has bigger roles to play than just uh, the work we do and when we can call ourselves architects. So I would like to say that in the context of learning and development and being part of a lifelong and ever questioning profession, this recommendation really is a win-win for all stakeholders. I think an integrated award with professional practical experience that leads to registra registration has a hugely competitive edge globally. I think qualifying graduates at the point of the integrated award will have access to the market nationally and internationally at the point of this graduation. And that, by the looks of what we're looking at today with flexible routes, can happen a lot earlier on than is happening in today's average situation. Uh, if the recommendations are adopted, students can study in several different ways under several <coughs> frameworks, really being quite reflective about their needs, their interests, their specialisms, um, but graduate through that single gateway and adopt a title that has meaning at that point. I think what's important is this professional competence that is needed for qualification being delivered during their education. And that's, that's so important and thinking back personally to really understanding why we're doing what we're doing. I think the route to qualification has to change. In most cases, it has to be reduced in length, but it definitely has to be more flexible. Our earning power has to change. Our charge-out rates have to change. And if this means using our professional title uh, to do this, then we should not be held by it. If anything, as a graduate, I also feel that if I possess a title, I want to be treated with a certain amount of respect and not be called an architectural assistant just because my ever curious views on professional issues meant that I wasn't ready to do part three. For fear of repeating us myself, I think our function, as it's not protected, should not be the thing that limits us. I think as everyone can provide architectural services, it's really about not putting aside good taste, putting aside design quality and looking at this point that there's an integrated award and that integrated award should mean something for our register. 
I think professional competence has to be garnered as early as possible within an integrated award, and upon achieving this, we have to have access to the Register of Architects. Thank you. Uh, next up, please welcome from Green Planning Studio, Green Planning Studio, Ruth Reed. Well, I'm really glad to see you're all awake still. I was rather hoping you'd be asleep, but uh, well then. Um, I sort of, it sort of falls to us at the end of the day to summarise, perhaps, uh, and I'm going to put my personal slant on it in a position of privilege. Um, I think it's been a good debate, and I think the outcomes are ones that I fully support. The future now holds great opportunities for the profession, as defined by Council through its decisions today. It's supported different modes of delivery, providing for more flexible routes into education and through education. And I think it's reforged the links between practice and education. I believe that the new models that will come forward should support our diverse educational offers and continue to support excellence in education. And that's, uh, I think I've had this, the privilege of going around the world and understanding the renown that our system has across the world. I mean, I think we do ourselves down when we fear competition. We are held in very, very high esteem. I and mean, the number of international schools seeking recognition through the RIBA is testament to that. I think that uh, I'm most pleased to see that the new framework is going to offer the possibility of a positive outcome to everybody who enters the courses in architecture, either at a degree level if they choose to uh, pursue other outcomes, or by a genuine prospect of entry to the profession. My retrospective study at BCU into the destinations of students from Birmingham School of Architecture re revealed a depressing succession of people who described their route as having dropped out or not good enough for architecture, or would not even engage with our survey. Even those who succeeded at part two, never got round to part three, didn't want to talk about why not. Um, I thought that was indicative of a sense of failure that we bring to a great proportion of those who start the courses. I'm confident that the new framework op offers the opportunity to develop courses where professional practice is integrated, thus giving students, employers, and clients as Stephen will tell you, they're important too, uh, confidence that students have engaged in learning across all the dimensions of architecture. I've heard that the quality of outcome will be ensured by a form of examination and professional competence, which makes my part three, very, part three hat very happy on its peg, uh, as, uh, as I have now hung it up. I'm hopeful, but not perhaps fully confident, that the interests of students will be protected by both academe and the profession. I fully support Jane in driving a campaign to make practice economically competent and able to support students. I have a personal interest in ensuring that we have a well-qualified cohort of young architects to su succeed us. I'm just a little sceptical that practices, battle-scarred after the profession, will queue up to support students. However, the kudos of teaching practice status will go a long way to encourage the better practices to offer support to integrated models. The knowledge that the students have already been taught some of the theory of practice before they enter the workplace will really help with this. The mismatch of the number of students and the number of potential placements remains my main reservation. However, I am prepared to believe that the new models agreed today will give more opportunities for experience with professional practices, co-professional practices and the trades than the current system which has students trying and most frequently failing to find placements. Throughout the recession, just a third of post part one students at BCU were finding home practices to work with. Students have been leaving architecture feeling rejected, frequently through bad luck and low self-esteem rather than any lack of skill. And it has had a disproportionate effect on young women. The outcome of the award, this integrated award, should be entry to the profession on graduation from the integrated course carrying the 300 credits that are borne by their competitors in the workplace coming from Europe to the jobs market, particularly in London, less so outside of London. Any proposal to keep PPE separate from the academic award will revert to the existing outcome of low numbers joining the profession. To delay qualification is to deny it. The high proportion of part twos who never go on to qualify a testament to the failure of our current system that forces students to wait on the external forces of economics and practices business models to be ready to qualify. 
I know it's not the gift of our IBA Council to decide when students can enter the register. It is that of ARB. However, the profession's voice does count in deciding how we meet the new directive. What is proposed in this recommendation before you now supports the existing standards and encourages a higher standard of outcome because professional practice will be integrated into the main course. As a former tutor and mentor, and now an employer, <coughs> I welcome the confidence that this will give students. Thank you. Uh, and the final of our three speakers from the University of Bath, Professor Alex Wright. Good afternoon. Um, one of the good things about being called Wright is you get trained from an early age to speak last. Um, this proposal addresses the point at which individuals might be allowed access to the ARB's register, and it states that this should be on graduation. Actually, this is already the case for many architects that join the UK register. However, it's an impossibility for those trained in the UK. Um, this proposal aims to address this anomaly. Prior to 2007, anyone wishing to enter the register had to meet the UK's professional qualification requirements. In 2007, the UK implemented the EU's Mutual Recognition of Professional Qualifications Directive, and the ARB was legally obliged to admit onto the register qualified architects from other EU member states. Across the EU, the national requirements vary, as we've heard. A few states require four years of academic study, most require five, some more. Some require no professional experience, some a year, and some more. Some, like the UK, have an access to market qualification, and others don't. The UK, therefore, has two standards of entry onto its register. Those that enter via the EU route do not necessarily have to have a part one, a part three, or any practical experience. Once on the register, there's no indication which standard an individual has met. The argument is sometimes made that the numbers entering the register via the EU route are relatively small, and so the anomaly is inconsequential. However, the figures do not support this view. Since 2010, those entering the register via the EU have uh, significantly increased from 324 in 2010 to 824 last year. In the same period, the numbers entering from UK education have remained pretty constant at around 950, which has been pretty much the same for the last couple of decades. If the trend of the last five years continues, 2015 will be the first year when the number of architects entering the register via the EU route exceeds the total number from all schools of architecture in the UK. Uh, for many, this is seen as an indication that the directive is working well in allowing people to move between different European countries. However, if the UK relies solely on the UK-trained architects for the first part, past five years to actually get through to part three, as we've heard in, from many speakers, it's maybe sobering to remind ourselves that the number of registered architects in the UK would have actually fallen. In order to address the inequality created by the asymmetric hurdles applicants have to clear in order to join the register, some change is necessary. One such change would be to allow a framework which gave all UK students the chance to register on graduation, exactly as this motion states. Um, as the final speaker, and as currently as chair of SCOSA, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity of thanking uh, Stephen Hodder, um, RRBA Council, um, David Gloucester, and the whole RRBA educa education team for putting architectural education centre stage. I think today has been an extraordinary event. Uh, we have an awful lot of work to do, and I'm aware <coughs> that God or the devil can be in the detail. We recognise the need for higher education, the RIBA and the ARB, and the wider profession to work together to ensure that UK architectural education can continue to thrive. And we look forward to working together with this shared aim in mind. Thank you very much.